the statement about it, uh, Alex yesterday in teaching about grace age salvation, message today is grace age sanctification, uh, tomorrow grace age suffering, and then grace age service, uh, and and Alex made the point that uh, the thing in common there is grace age, and that's certainly what's in common. Uh, also, what's in common is everyone started with an S. Um, but after, but all that as well, what really you know, links them all together is there's four times the Apostle Paul sp- speaks about uh, faithful sayings. And there's four faithful sayings, and every one of them are found in Timothy and in Titus. Uh, there's 1 Timothy 1.15 that we looked at yesterday, 1 Timothy 4, verse 9 that we're going to look at today among the con- context as well. And then 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11, and finally in Titus chapter 3 and verse 8. These are four faithful sayings of the Apostle Paul. Uh, keep in mind, as you come to this section of the Bible, you're in 1 and 2 Timothy and then Titus. Actually, 2 Timothy ends the Paul's epistles. You're coming into a time where Paul, you're nearing the end of Paul's ministry. And at the same time, keep in mind, you're, you're coming to a time in which the church is entering into apostasy. Paul had been ministering, establishing the churches, and, and then all of a sudden, as you come to the end of his ministry, there's an apostasy. Starts setting in in 1 Timothy, and it w- widespread in 2 Timothy. And that's when Paul calls to us to these faithful sayings, reminding us of the faithful sayings, encouraging us to stand and be faithful as the church goes into apostasy. Let me read to you f- to get started. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, and that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do pray as we look at this passage of Scripture that there will be several things that will just speak to our heart, that these faithful sayings might something that we would understand, and and this statement about godliness uh, and the profitability of it. Father, I pray that we'd all receive it, and uh, we pray that we'll go out of here today uh, not just more informed, but more of your word and more of your purpose in our heart. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You know, I'm going to be talking and centering around the word uh, godliness in here. I said the the four messages from yesterday and, and the rest until Thursday all start with an S. Well, Grace Age Sanctification is kind of the the title of my message, and it really is a good title, although anybody's asked me about it, say, well, that's not really what I'm going to talk about, uh, because it's a, it, grace age sanctification. Paul talks about sanctification in all of his epistles, uh, especially following the doctrinal section of his epistles. He'll talk to us about pract- uh, positional sanctification and then practical sanctification. Sanctification means to be set apart as holy unto God for his purpose, for his service. And, uh, and they're positionally in Christ. When you trust Jesus Christ, you are set apart as holy unto God for his service and for his purpose. Uh, but at the same time, you're challenged after that to you to set yourself apart for God's service and for his purpose. So there is that. But the term, the, the sanctification is not a term used in the reading that we're using here. It, it might be the thought, but we're talking about here about godliness and, uh, and, and certainly that goal of godliness is uh, the ultimate goal of sanctification. And, and we'll see that as we're going to look at that, that uh, word, to be set apart as holy. And in fact, when I think about it, the, sanctif- the, the godliness that's talked about in these verses is actually the goal of sanctification. The ultimate reaching to where it says in 2 Timothy, that um, i just read it to you, 2 Timothy uh, 221 it says uh, if a man therefore purge himself of these things he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use prepared unto every good work so the godliness is actually being prepared and meet for the master's use prepared unto every good work 
And it's reaching that place of godliness. So we're going to start talking about that. But at the same time, I thought to myself, you know, we're going to be talking about the highest form of Christian living. But you have to be a Christian first, or what the Bible calls a believer. You have to be what the Bible says, saved. And it'd be wrong to sit there and just start preaching about some things without without first going over the gospel, making sure that every person here does know what the gospel is. Because you can grow up in a church and you can be under the sound of the gospel maybe or under sound of preaching, but never have come to a place in your life where you've really made a decision about your salvation. Perhaps you know, and if you don't know, you need to know that the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That there's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, We all become unprofitable to God because we're sinners. God is a holy God, and God can't dwell in the presence of sin. And there's nothing you can do if you're a sinner to get rid of your sin. That's the amazing part about that. Everyone thinks there's something you can do. You can go to church or something, start cleaning up your life and all of that, but none of that can take away sin. Once you're a sinner, it's too late, and you can't be your own savior. And that's why the verses that we were going over yesterday about when we were without strength, you have no ability to deal with your sin problem. But when you were without strength, in due time, the Bible says Christ died for the ungodly. The the good news of the gospel, and it's called the gospel of the grace of God, is what you don't deserve and cannot earn, Jesus Christ provided for you by coming down to earth, living an absolutely perfect life, Becoming what the Bible says, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Because the cross is a place where criminals die. It's a place where you and I all all deserve to die. But the Bible says Christ died for us. That is, he took our place. He's the sinless son of God who went to the cross and our sins were placed on him. And he fully, completely paid the penalty of our sins so that the redemption freedom from the penalty of sin is through the blood of Jesus Christ offered to everybody today by God's grace on the basis of faith in what Jesus Christ did because Jesus Christ is the propitiation full satisfying payment for our sins and when you trust what Jesus Christ did on the cross God gives you the gift of eternal life for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself it's the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast so It's for you to realize that you're a sinner. You can't save yourself. God loved you despite your sin. Christ died for you. The Bible says God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ died and paid for your sins, was buried and rose again for your justification. And when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, the one who paid for your sins, God freely gives you eternal life. Now you'll learn as we study on that not only did he give you eternal life, he gave you some other things. And we're studying in this passage of Scripture some warnings that the Apostle Paul is given that leads us to understand some things about godliness. We started in verse 6, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things. Now, I didn't purposely go back up into the earlier verses, but he's warning that the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That the parting of the faith, they're going to give heed. There's ways that Satan is operating to seduce people by false doctrine. And, and, uh, and some of the false doctrine there, the forbidding to marry and the eating of meats, I don't know that we've even seen the full application of that. There's been a, it's always been around in one form or another. But it, it sp- says that the, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times. So when you get down to verse 6, Paul says... To Timothy, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, don't forget these things. Don't forget about seducing spirits, doctrines of devils that would draw you away from the faith. And, uh, and, and, and there's ways that he would do that. But if, if Timothy would be, uh, he'd be a good minister, if he put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So there's that good, that, that faith that Timothy has uh, attained to and the good doctrine that he is supposed to continue to minister out and that he has attained. But then there's a contrast in verse 7, but refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. So there's, you can already see some things I want you to see all through the passages that we're looking at is that when you get away from the good doctrine, 
that that's when you, you get into the fables and all, but that's where you lose the access to the godliness. So he says, um, but refuse profane and, and, and old wise fables and exercise thyself unto godliness. So the, the center that we want to look at today is about that godliness there, and it's in contrast to the good doc, what's in the godliness comes from the good doctrine. It's in contrast to someone who would follow old wives' fables. And, and that's what Paul's warning Timothy. In fact, Paul speaks about in chapter one about fables. He's speaking about in chapter six again about fables and talks about it again in Titus. He's, he's worried about fables. In fact, Titus, he talks about Jewish fables. Here it's wise fables, old wives' fables. And then uh, even Second Peter, he talks about cunningly devised fables. So there's this tendency to get away from the good words of faith and good doctrine. And, and as a result of that, you won't be exercised unto godliness. It'll lead away from, uh, from godliness. And, and so the warning there is about these fables. Now, interesting in verse 7, but refuse. And look, the fables aren't just mild fables. He calls them profane in old wise fables. If something is profane, something is against something that's holy unto God. And what's holy unto God is, I don't have it on this Bible, but it's a holy Bible. And rather than God's word being what's being taught to people, some people only in life learn fables. And sometimes when they go to church, all they hear is stories. They hear fables. But that expression, old wise fables, I'm thinking that that is a, a way of expressing that that women have passed down in order to get their kids to line up. They, they've learned some stories that they would tell kids to scare them from doing wrong. And, and then, and then the, that child grows up and all he knows in life is old wives' fables. Different things that they've been told in order to, to keep control of things. And, and so, you know, that's, that's some, sometimes all that people know. But P- Timothy is being told to instruct people in those good words of faith and that good doctrine. Uh, because those are the things that's going to produce godliness. The old wise fables, they're profane in fact. Now, Old wise fables, They're, they come in all kinds of different ways, and I'm not going to try to figure out a whole list of them. I was fortunate to have a grandmother. My, my parents, my dad's parents, both died very young. I never knew them at all. Uh, my mother's father was away, and, and we never hardly saw him, and then he died pretty young as well. So I had one grandparent in my life, and my grandmother, and boy, we were close. In fact, she had ten grandchildren. They all would say they're the favorite. Uh, <laughs> But she, she was really special. But my grandma was not the grandma that you might think about. <laughs> there was no going over her house, making cookies. <laughs> my grandma knew the ways of the world. <laughs> and, uh, and she taught me some ways of the world. She taught me a lot of things about life. But, but she also, also taught me all those different kind of fables. Like, for instance, if a pitcher fell off a wall, I knew someone was, something bad was going to happen. Perhaps someone was going to die. I knew that if a clock stopped, that whatever number it stopped at, in that many days, someone was going to die. <laughs> then I also learned two other people had to die because death always comes in three. <laughs> so, <laughs> you've heard those stories too. <laughs> so anyhow, my, my grandma, she, she taught me all kinds of things, but that, that, that her life was all, all things worldly like that. <laughs> uh, but I did grow up in a Christian home, by the way. <laughs> her, her, daughter, her father was a minister. <laughs> Watch out for them children, those uh, preacher's kids, huh? <laughs> Anyhow, wise fables. So since we're paused here, I might as well tell you about the science. Now, this is not a wise fable, but a science teacher uh, wanted to teach his class something. So be- beginning of class, he had four beakers sitting there and one was full of alcohol, the other was full of narcotics, one was full of, uh, uh, no, <laughs> tobacco, <laughs> and then was, one was full of good soil. And so he says, now see these beakers, he told what was in it, and so he dropped a worm in the alcohol, a worm in the narcotics, a worm in the tobacco, and a worm in good soil. Then he taught his class. When he got done, he said, oh, let's see how those worms are doing. Well, sure enough, the worm in the alcohol, it's dead. The worm in the narcotics, it's eat up, it's dead. 
the worm in the tobacco is dead. The worm in good soil, it's alive and well. And he said, now, what do you think the answer, what is the, the, the story behind this? Johnny raises his hand. He said, yeah, Johnny, what is it? He says, the story is, if you drink beer, smoke cigarettes, and take drugs, you won't have worms. <laughs> That's why we got to use the Bible. Fables don't work. <laughs> if you look at the, so the warning in verse 7, but refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. So the first part of verse 8 there, when it says bodily exercise profiteth little. Uh, I probably shared this once before, but there was a man at our church, and he come one time, and he just trying to be honest with the Bible, but he's a guy that worried about his health and took care of himself, and he was really troubled that the Bible would say bodily exercise profiteth little. There's a lot of profit in bodily exercise, he would argue. And so I'm over there trying to defend the Bible because I understand his point. There is some profit in it. And so I'm trying to get him to understand that this is a comparison about thing. That even if the, even if bodily exercise profiteth little, there's two ways of looking at that. The Bible is agreeing it profits. It just profits little. So there's a little profit in it. So I'm trying to encourage that didn't go over too well. But the really, when you look at the verse, you understand exactly what it's talking about. It is profitable. But it's only profit, profitable for you physically. In contrast to that, godliness is profitable unto all things. Godliness is profitable not only for you physically. It might keep you away from things that's going to damage you physically. It is certainly is good for you emotionally because it will keep you out of things that can destroy your emotion life. It certainly can keep you, uh, it, it can, it, it's going to help you, no doubt, spiritually and it's going to help you not only in this life, but it's going to help you in the life to come. So if you compare just the one aspect of this life is just physical, but godliness helps in every aspect of this life, as well as eternity future. So it's profitable in comparison, uh, more profitable, and that's why it's called little bodily exercise profiteth little. Now, you know, in, in the area that we live in, they actually tore down a bowling alley, a pretty good-sized bowling alley. We wondered what in the world they were going to build in its place, and they built an L.A. fitness center. This thing is huge. And when they were building it, I thought, you know, there's already all kinds of 24-hour fitness and Planet Hollywood or whatever they're called. Not Hollywood. What is it called? <laughs> Planet Fitness. <laughs> but the, the, they got these 24-hour gyms. And now they're building another one, and it's bigger than all the rest. And I thought, there's no way that that place is going to be able to survive. There, that place is packed. But every time I pass it, there's cars all over the place because everybody is worried about their physical health. And they got all these places to go and exercise. And, and, and when they go there, they, what do they have those... Uh, uh, they're, they're no judgment zones. They, I guess they, I don't know if they have mirrors or they don't have mirrors, but the whole idea, there's a buzzer there. If someone's intimidating you because they're exercising extra hard and, and you don't feel like you measured up, you know, they had that commercial, the guy walks in the gym and he's muscular as can be, and what do you do? I pick things up and put them down. <laughs> and that's all, that's all he can say. I pick things up and put them down. And they just walked him to the back door, opened it up and let him out. They didn't want them in this gym because they don't want to uh, offend anybody, intimidate anybody in the gym. So, the, you know, they show him the door. Now, my son, he is physically fit. And, uh, and he, he's on a sports thing, and he started telling me how they're making fun of these fitness centers that, that you know, they have bagels Thursday or something and tacos some other day. I asked him if they have a donut shop in there or not. But... <laughs> But I guess in his sports thing, they, they, they make fun of this, and uh, they laugh about them having all these days. And there's a video, I didn't see it, he told me about, where they actually, two, a couple of muscular guys went into the gym while people were working out, 
and they take off their shirt and they start flexing and they start picking up weights and you know they're now intimidating everybody because there's a guy there skinny as can be with his girlfriend and his girlfriend is just mesmerized on these guys <laughs> and the video shows him trying to drag his girlfriend away and she won't go uh, so anyhow they, they, there's all this fitness but all that just profits little um, <laughs> Godliness is profitable to all things. Now, what I want to talk about is that I might not be as smart as you, but that expression, godliness, what exactly is godliness? Now, I I can give you a part of an answer right now because certainly the context, we were talking about bodily exercise and godliness is profitable to all things. Godliness is certainly being spiritually fit. That would certainly match what godliness is just by the context here. Um, but, but to actually talk about what godliness is, to me, it gets a little elusive. Uh, so I want to talk to you. I want to look at some verses and learn from the Bible what is godliness. Then I want to talk about where does it come from and then how do we get it. So because that's the context here. Now, when I, when I looked it up, I actually went to the Webster 1828 dictionary to find out, okay, what does godliness mean? And I'm not satisfied here. He says godliness, it's a noun, so it, he says it, it, it means piety, belief in God, and reverence for uh, his character and laws. A little bit more explanation. A religious life, a careful observance of the laws of God and performance of religious duties thinking, man, this just doesn't sound right. This, uh, when you start talking about God, uh, keeping of God's laws, that's not grace. Now, it might, it might involve doing what, things that are right, but the, the, when he talked about God's laws and then starts talking about performance, especially of religious duties, I, I just can't go with that definition. Uh, another person had talked about godliness, and he did the same thing trying to define it, but he defined it as Christian character, but not just Christian character, Christian character that springs from devotion to God. So that he says, godliness is defined as devotion to God, which results in a life that's pleasing to him. In, in explanation, when he talks about that, that the foundation of godliness is devotion, well, now everything about godliness now centers on how devout I am, how devout I am to things of God. And there's too much expression. To me, when I look at that, there's something short of that because the, the, everything is on me. And godliness is something that, that doesn't come from me. We already saw that it's associated with, some, with faith and good doctrine that Timothy was instructed to keep teaching in light of false doctrine that's going to come around. So uh, the best way to find out exactly what godliness is, is to use the Bible and look at the context of the verses. Now, the Apostle Paul, it, the first thing, when you start studying godliness, everybody who studies it, the first thing they realize that never even showed up in the Bible until 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, and that it's found in, in 2 Titus and then also in 2 Peter. And that, that's interesting as well. And yet, in, in 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus, Paul will use that expression 11 times. But it never showed up until you come to this section of the Bible, in this section of Paul's epistles. And interesting to me that it shows up in 2 Peter, and we'll talk about that when we get there. But even though it showed up 11 times, they're all close together. I want you to see verses that talk about godliness. Come back to 1, Peter, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, one of the things is the word godly is either a verb or an adjective. Uh, it either describes or it, it's an action. That's the word godly. But godliness itself, that, that is a, a noun. It's a state of being. Uh, and that's why it makes it a little different than, than just the word godly. And uh, when other, other words that end in N-E-S-S like that would be when you talk about someone who you talk about happiness. That's a state of being. Joyfulness is a state of being. Godliness here is a state of being. And, and so that's why we're not only going to define it, where does it come from and how do we get it? So in 1 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul starts out praying, asking, telling us to pray for all men. But in verse, verse 2 of chapter 2, he, he zeroes in on kings. 
He said in praying, he said, pray for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. So the idea of praying for kings, that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life. The idea of that is kings rule and they can make havoc of your life. And if you're going to live for the Lord, you could have problems if the king interferes in areas where God has not given him authority to operate. Government has a a responsibility of protection of society, of protection of the nation. But you're to pray for kings so that you might lead a quiet and peaceful life, so that you're quiet in the sense that you don't have to worry about dealing with a king who's against you standing and living for the Lord. And, and peaceful then that you can live in peace and, and do the work of the ministry in peace without having to deal with government or hiding from government. And that's why it says a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. And there you get the idea that God, godliness has to be with, has to do with living who you are in Christ. Amen. And to do that in honesty. Meaning, you don't have to lie so they don't kill you. You don't have to hide. You don't have to protect your your testimony from the wrong wrong people that the government's after you. You pray for government that you might lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Living who God has made you in Christ and doing that honestly before men. Nothing hidden. Everything seen. They can see what you believe by the action, by the way that you're living. And, and so you realize that that's something about what godliness is. It doesn't really tell us where it comes from. Some of the other verses might, though. Yeah, in the same chapter, if you get down to verse, uh, in verse 9, after he talked about the men should do the praying, and it's talking about in the assembly, and, it, and it's got to be certain men without wrath and lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Verse 9 says, In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, Not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but, and then the parentheses, which becometh women professing godliness with all good works. So certainly there, the the women professing godliness is how the women act, even the way, that shamefacedness, how bold they are in approaching and, and extending themselves out and dressing to draw attention That those are the things he said, stay away. Those are all external things. But he says, rather than that, he said, that which which becometh women professing godliness. That is, a woman conducting herself that speaks volumes about her relationship with the Lord. And, 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 And so it's something that's internal rather than external. And it presents some, it speaks for itself. And, and, and so, He's instructing women to concentrate on that area of their life and profess godliness. Uh, then I'll come over with me to um, chapter 3 and start in verse 15. He says, But if thou tarry long, talking to Timothy and why he's writing these things, that thou mayest know how to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, the, when, I, when I read that verse there, and it says, um, how to behave thyself in the house of God, it's going to define what the house of God is. Where is it that God lives? Which is the church of the living God. God lives in the believer today. And, and the idea there that, that God is present in earth, but he's present in the believer, and, and that the collective believers are the pillar and ground of the truth. They're not the truth, they're pillar and ground of the truth. But with that idea that God lives in the, the members of the church, the body of Christ, then he says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So you get an idea what godliness is, just the first part of that. God was manifested in the flesh. Now that's, that's, a, that's a key verse to understanding what godliness is. It's God being manifest in our flesh. It, it, we just learned that from, from what it talked about women professing godliness. So it's God manifested in the flesh. In chapter 4, in verse 7 there, uh, 
that there is the exercise that needs to, you need to exercise unto godliness. So one of the things we learned about godliness, it's not automatic. It, it, there must be effort behind it, but, but it, it's something that is, happens through a discipline. And bodily exercise profit a little. Godliness is profitable to all things. And so it's a benefit in godliness in this life and that which is to come. Now there'll be later on in the week some people will talk about the benefits of, of, of uh, rewards in the future. But that's the idea here. Not only does it benefit all your life here, but there's certainly going to be a benefit. Godliness is going to be important to God at the judgment seat of Christ. Of what he has produced in our life. So come over to chapter 6 and verse 3. Now notice this. There's another key here. It says, if any man teach otherwise, and that's other than, than uh, what Paul's been instructing, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness... He's proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions, strife of words, whereof cometh envy and strife and evil, evil, evil surmisings. You just, just make up stuff because, well, he's going to learn you're destitute of the truth. But, but before I get past verse 3 there, uh, that if a man teach otherwise, but other than what? Other than the wholesome words even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine according to godliness. There is a doctrine that centers around godliness. There's a doctrine that brings us to the place of godliness. And, and, and that's why if you teach something else, that doctrine isn't going to produce godliness in God's people. So there's a doctrine according to godliness, that, that whole thing that Timothy is to teach, that good doctrine, and that produces the godliness. And uh, by the way, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we are, 1 Corinthians 14, If any man spiritual that acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But I often think of that Ephesians chapter 4, where he's talking about don't live in the vanity of your mind like the Gentiles do. But he says, and, and then he says, But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that you've heard him and been taught by him. Well, when did you hear Jesus Christ and were taught by Jesus Christ? Through the Apostle Paul. <laughs> That's exactly. So when you talk about the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the doctrine according to godliness. We're talking about the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. To us Gentiles. Taught by the Apostle Paul. And, and that is a doctrine that brings about godliness. It's the doctrine of the grace of God. It's what God's accomplishing in grace. And what his grace has accomplished. Not only in saving us. But in being able to produce in our life godliness. He goes on to talk about those with this, you know, that are ter teaching otherwise, perver per perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. So those that are teaching otherwise in their surmising of things and their perverse disputings and all of that, they come to a conclusion that gain is godliness. Now if you look at the next verse, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So they got it backwards. Gain is not godliness, but godliness is gain. And, and they got it all backwards, but they think, oh man, I, I'm so famous, I'm, I'm so well known, that God is really blessing, look at the followers I have, look at the TV ministry I have, look at the money that's coming in, God is certainly blessed, and they think, the, they just, they, they think gain is godliness. But he's going, he goes on to talk about, you're not going to take anything with you. So gain is not godliness, but godliness is gain. It, there's gain in this life and the life which is to come. So the, there's that false teaching. Now, come over to 2 Timothy chapter 6. No, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Oh, you know what? There is 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6 I wanted to show you. This is going by too fast. First Timothy chapter 6. Just flip back there. I'm going to have to skip several things. But verse 11. It says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patient, meekness. Now, the reason I read that verse, 
there's, there's five things that Timothy is supposed to follow after. Godliness is one of them. So if we're trying to define godliness, godliness is not those other four things. So that godliness is not righteousness. Godliness is not faith. Godliness is not love. Godliness is not patient. So godliness is something other than those things. Um, over in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, it talks about those who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Uh, if you want to just write it down, we're going to move quickly here. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5 is, is that verse. But I wanted you to catch the form. There's religious men, they have a form of godliness. Godliness is not a form on the outside. They deny the power thereof. So godliness is a power. A power to produce something on the inside that, that, that is profitable. That, that, that is actually defined as godliness. And Titus chapter 1 verse 1 talks about the, the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. Paul is the, brings about the faith of God's elect according to the, the, the truth. Uh, 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 I might as well read the verse instead of messing it up. Titus 1 1. Paul, the servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. So Paul brings the faith to us believers today, and the acknowledging of that truth produces the godliness. So godliness is centered around some truth that's been given to us by the apostle Paul. So we start looking at those things. Now, in, in, in Second Peter, the reason I find that interesting, that's where Peter's catching on to Paul's ministry. And he says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 that God has given us all things that pertaineth to life and godliness. So Peter's understanding something about godliness as well. And he talks about, oh, what, those eight things add to your faith, virtue, and so forth. But godliness is just one of those eight things. It's not those eight things. And then he says in 2 Peter chapter 3 uh, in verse 11 uh, about a holy conversation and godliness. And that's interesting because a holy conversation and a holy lifestyle is not godliness. It might come from godliness, but the holy lifestyle is not godliness. So I hope I got you all confused and you're saying, what exactly now is godliness? Because that, that's I kept looking at these verses and thinking about that. And I've come to understand godliness to be this. It is the product of the faith uh, of the full revelation of God and the fruit of of what we now have. Amen. Now understand what we now have because we have something that from the time of Adam to the, uh, to the end of Paul's life, no one ever had. And we've had it for 2,000 years, that is, we the members of the body of Christ. We have God's Holy Spirit the moment we get saved, and we have a complete Bible. And not only a complete Bible, a complete Bible that it tells us the revelation of the mystery that had been hid from ages and from generations. We have the mystery of God's grace revealed to us. And with those two things, you can almost call them three, because it's not just the Bible, it's the Bible that includes particularly the revelation of the mystery. That with that, that the fruit of having that, 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 that uh, the ultimate goal of transformation takes place. In Romans 12, 2, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We have not only God's Holy Spirit, so there's the power inside, we have the knowledge of the, the doctrine of God's grace, what He's given to us, who He's made us in Christ, that when we start understanding what God has revealed and what has God has given to us, not only in this world, but in the world to come, we understand that there's a transformation that takes place in the inside of your being that actually produces godliness. There's a spiritual growth. It is the character of God that is produced in us. It's God manifested in our flesh. It's God's purpose for us in grace. So that... If we understand that, that that's what it is, it's the life of, of Christ manifested in us, then the question is, where does it come from? Well, we've been looking at all those verses for the understanding that it's, there's a doctrine according to grace. It's the, the faith of God's elect, which is after godliness. Everything centers around Paul's epistles. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And this is real important to understanding godliness. Godliness is the fruit 
of having the Holy Spirit and the complete Word of God, including the Word of God's grace. So when Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth, he goes on to explain some people that didn't. But, but shun profane and vain babblings. That's people getting away from the truth, rightly divided, right? For they will increase unto more ungodliness. No wonder those old wise fables are called profane. They're against what God, the holiness God wants to produce in our life. It won't produce it. There's no power in it. Right division. Knowing the truth of God's word rightly divided is the means by which the transformation takes place in your life. Now, that there's, a whole, there's a whole study of that that we're not going to get into. Just the idea, where does godliness come from? Verse 17, their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already and overthrew the faith of some. So false doctrine takes away, will not produce godliness in your life. You know, you think about Satan's attack. And certainly, well, let me show you this. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I can show you a couple things here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says in verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the, Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts, To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You understand a couple things there. Satan has blinded the minds of them that believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. Satan don't want anybody saved. He works against that. Our job is to make sure he doesn't use us as a vessel to stop people from getting saved. Because God has shined his light in our hearts so that we might give the knowledge of the light of the, of, of the glory of, of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That we might reflect the glory of Jesus Christ. You know, back in Genesis, when God created man, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, You can look at that and say, well, image and likeness, they're so close. They are very close. But they're not the same thing. Neither in chapter 2 of Genesis, when it says, after he made the heavens and the earth, it says, created and made. Created and made aren't the same thing. They're sometimes closely used, but they're different. Image, we know what an image is. It's certainly an appearance, an outward appearance of something. Uh, Jesus Christ is the image, we just read it here, of God. But image, when in, in Exodus, they're not to make any graven image. Then it says, of any likeness. And then you got a likeness. In fact, when Adam, after he sinned, it said he bore a son in his own likeness after his image. The, the image, we're all created in the image of God. Even Noah, when he got off the ark, they're, they're to execute uh, judgment upon someone who murders because man was created in the image of God. But he didn't say anything about likeness anymore. When Adam sinned and had a son, not only was the son in the image of Adam, he was also in the likeness of Adam. And that would be a sinful likeness. Likeness there, it can be like a resemblance. It it can be like, it looks like, but it's not, it's the same in a different way. It's, for me, if I could express it it this way, in our house, um, I have one brother and three sisters, Uh, I'm the most like my dad. My mom used to throw that in my face. (laughs) Oh, you're just like your dad. But but when I go back to Pennsylvania where he was raised, I I go by and see some relatives that we haven't seen in a long time. And I walked up there one day, and, and one of my cousins, she's actually an older cousin, but when I walked up there, she says, man, you are just like your dad. You look like your dad. You sound like your dad. You even walked up here like your dad walks. 
Now, my brother's nothing like that. I told him he was adopted since he was little. He actually had that DNA test done because <laughs> I think he really believed he was adopted. I've been telling him since he was a kid. <laughs> but there is, I understand what they're saying. I can resemble my dad without looks because they're, they're, the, my actions, the reflection of my voice, they say the way that I walk. So that you got the image and the likeness and and when you talk about godliness, I guess the children's definition of godliness is God-likeness. And it works. Because that's what God is producing in us. He put the light of the glorious gospel in us to shine out the, the, the glory of the face of Jesus Christ. So that when you get down to verse 11, it says, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. The life of Jesus Christ. God has shined something in us. And he's put his spirit in us. And that spirit is called the spirit of Christ. So that the life of Christ is manifest in us. God, Godliness is God manifest in the flesh. God wants to manifest the life of Christ in us. And he does it through transformation, renewing of your mind. He does it through the word of his grace, building us up and, and transforming our life. So that there is, you know, there, there's sometimes when you say a resemblance, you can walk up and you, you'd say, you remind me of somebody and I can't think of who it is. There are things in your life and maybe you can't even measure it. But there are things that God's word and God's grace has produced in your life that someone sees an attribute of Jesus Christ in you and can't quite put a finger on it. But maybe they can put a finger on it. But God is working in us the will and to do of his good pleasure. And godliness is the fruit of the Spirit of God and the Word of God's grace and us being true to that message, not getting away from it into a false doctrine that transforms our life, that produces the life of Christ. How do you get it? Look at chapter 3 and look at verse 17. It says, for the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with an open face, as beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Now what the Apostle Paul is talking about, we who have the Holy Spirit, and the Bible, when it says, as we with an open face, that means nothing blocking our view. We, the, the Word of God has given us clearly the truth of who God has made us in Christ. We can study it. We can see it. We can know it. We can believe it. So there's nothing There's nothing that, that God has. When we have a completed Word of God, there's nothing to obscure our view of what God has made us in Christ. So we as beholding uh, with an open face, beholding in a glass, and that would be the mirror, the glory of the Lord Jesus. When we study this Bible, we study God's grace. We're seeing the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. What God has accomplished through Jesus Christ unto our glory. And, and so we, 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 we see here, we look in that glass, we see the glory of the Lord. And as we look at that, we see who we are in Christ. We become changed into that same image. A little at a time from glory to glory. He didn't tell me how to turn it off. I'll hit something, it'll start over again a bit. <laughs> so, uh, there's one more before I try to bring that last conclusion up. Uh, come over to Ephesians chapter 4. When I was talking, we went to 2 Corinthians, I was talking about Satan. Satan wants to stop people from getting saved. Because if he stops them from getting saved, when you get saved, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. But you're not only sealed with the Holy Spirit, you have the Holy Spirit now working in our life. And, and taking the word of God and transforming our life. So that if he can stop you from getting saved, a person, then not only are they going to hell, they're certainly not going to reflect the glory of Jesus Christ. But then, if someone gets saved, if it's good doctrine, what a way to corrupt good doctrine, but corrupt the Bible. So Satan attacks on the Bible so people won't get the true doctrine of grace that's able to, to make that transformation to godliness that God wants accomplished in our life. 
Then if they just, if they happen to stick with the King James Bible and be in the right Bible, but they don't rightly divide the word of truth, it brings about ungodliness. So Satan attacks all these areas because the ultimate goal for us is that God produce the life of Christ in us. We have the life of Christ in us, but to actually be seen out from us. In, in that Ephesians chapter 4, out of the gifts that God has given, they were given till, verse 13, it says, till we all come to the unity of the faith. There's the, the word of God for us. And the word of God for us brings us to this. The knowledge of the Son of God. We have the knowledge of God's Son. Everything that God wants to reveal about and for His Son and His Son through us. But notice the next word is unto. Once we have a Bible that tells us all about God's Son, it brings us unto a perfect man, maturity. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Stature. Usually we say that's a person who's grown to full height. But we're not talking physical, are we? We're talking about, we're not talking about bodily exercise, profit of little. We're talking about godliness that's profitable to all things. The stature of the fullness of Christ is the measure of Christ in our life. And the word of God is able to produce that. So, with that statement, let me, like we talked about what is godliness how do you get godliness? It's through God's word rightly divided. But when I say God's word rightly divided, it's not the knowledge of God's word rightly divided. It's the wisdom of, and revelation that you get from understanding the word rightly divided. Amen. We're not just talking about a mental thing. Paul, when he talks about knowledge, he always adds wisdom and understanding. And if you just have knowledge, you haven't got it yet. But when you get that wisdom and understanding, the transformation starts taking place. So, that's where it comes from. The, the last part that we wanted to ask, how do you get it? Well, it's not hereditary. <laughs> you don't get it from the genes of your parents. It's not contagious. If someone's got it next to you, you can't get it from them. It's not automatic. We've already realized that. There's no shortcut to fitness. You have to exercise yourself unto godliness. You ha there, there is a certain discipline that you do. Timothy was nourished up in words of faith. You think it takes a steady diet to be godly? It certainly does. It takes a steady go diet of God's word rightly divided. So, therefore, if it takes some exercise, may maybe it's going to take some you using your body. And when I say using your body, there's some things that you need to do. You need to maybe get up and go, like to a conference like this, where you have a whole week of the Word of God's grace being taught to you. So there, there's things that you do that, that can actually bring about how you get godliness. And, uh, and certainly, you won't just want to wait a year to come and, and get built up in the faith again. Something you probably should do, not just weekly, but more than weekly. It's certainly something you need to do is to exercise even your eyeballs. Maybe you have to pick up a Bible and use the muscle in your eyes to read some of God's Word. But you know, they always talk about brain exercise now because they're finding out you to know, use your brain, you're going you know, to hold on to it longer. So there's brain exercise like letting the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So that those things are some of the things. You might even then start realizing that I need to walk worthy of the vocation worth I'm called. So there's a, a walk that's going to come about. Maybe you're going to run the race that Paul talked about that he run, ran lawfully. So there is some things that you do. But you must endure in sound doctrine for that to produce God's life, the life of Christ in us, so that godliness is actually produced and you benefit from it not only in this life but the life to come. So not only it's sound doctrine but that sound doctrine of God's word rightly divided, rightly, right division is not just the key to understanding the Bible. What we're saying in all of this, right division is the source of wisdom and knowledge whereby we reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God where we can be nourished up in those words of faith and sound doctrine through which we also 
can attain. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we realize that we took a subject that's really large. The ultimate goal of what you want to produce in our life. The very glory of your Son that can actually be sensed, picked up, seen by others. And, uh, and yet, it's not our effort, our religious performance. Father, it's us just learning who Christ is and who you've made us in Christ and allowing that to dwell in us richly so that, there's a per, that you produce in us that life, a real power, a real source, a real life. And we thank you for all the benefits that it brings into the life that we're now living. And Father, we just look forward even to those ages to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.